Hitler said that the Third Reich would last a thousand years. Thanks to World War II, it ended up only lasting about 12 years. But what happened afterwards? What do you do with a country that's been left in total shambles by a political party led by a fanatical leader and his cult of personality? The process of turning post-World War II Germany back into a country that wouldn't try to take over Europe and genocide people was known as denazification. Starting in 1946, the Allied Control Council issued a series of directives to try and totally purge the Nazi ideology from Germany forever. All the countries occupying Germany, America, Britain, France, and Russia, had all agreed to get on board with denazification. Nobody really wanted Nazis lingering around for too long. Denazification was a pretty massive undertaking. Roughly 8.5 million Germans, or 10% of the whole population at the time, had been party members. And that wasn't the full reach of the party. Nazi-related organizations had way more people and had huge memberships. The German Labor Front had 25 million members. The National Socialist People's Welfare Organization had 17 million members. Then, there was the League of German Women, the Hitler Youth, and so on. The Nazi party combined with these various organizations that they used to run Germany involved roughly 45 million people. This was not going to be easy. Because there were just so many people in the party, the first problem was figuring out who exactly needed to be investigated. They weren't just going to throw 8.5 million people, most of whom had nothing to do with the military, in jail. But who did need to go to jail? Who was really responsible to an unacceptable degree? The Morgenthau Plan, created by the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, recommended destroying the entire industrial capacity of Germany. This would ensure that if there was going to be a World War III, it at least wouldn't be started by Germans. It literally advocated for reducing Germany to a country of subsistence farming, sending them back several hundred years into the past. Luckily for Germany, people quickly realized that this was crazy and would never work. After all, the punishment given to Germany after World War I was one of the main causes of World War II. People realized that an even harsher punishment than the Treaty of Versailles was bound to have some unintended consequences. They also didn't want to accidentally make Germans hate the Allies so much they ended up becoming communists. Officially speaking, there were to be no exceptions to the process of denazification. But in reality, secret exceptions were made by both America and Russia. Both countries wanted to recruit German rocket scientists instead of prosecute them for potential war crimes. America ended up taking 785 German scientists and engineers back to the United States. Some of them, like Werner von Braun, would end up becoming key figures at NASA. The real high-level Nazis who hadn't killed themselves by this point, such as Goring, Hess, and Speer, would be put in trial for the war crimes. Originally, the British wanted to simply arrest them and shoot them. This would have been fitting in a way, since that's what the Nazis did to plenty of people. But it also wouldn't have looked as good to the German public. At the Nuremberg trials, their crimes were publicized in an effort to expose everything to the world. There were still some Germans who considered the trials to just be so-called victor's justice, and who didn't see them as having a real legal foundation. The United States military really went after denazification hard. They were more rigorous and intense than any of the other occupying countries, especially early on in the process. The process of denazification began with requiring all Germans to fill out a questionnaire. It had questions about what they had done during the Third Reich. Five categories of Germans were created based on these questionnaires. Major offenders, offenders, lesser offenders, followers, and exonerated persons. Eisenhower originally estimated that denazification would take 50 years. This means he thought that Germany would still be at least somewhat Nazi in the year 1996. It's a good thing he was wrong about that. Denazification was greatly helped by a German who was very anti-Nazi. In 1945, he obtained a nearly complete list of Nazi party members and gave it to the Allies. With this list, it was possible to verify the claims people were making about their participation or lack thereof. The 1.5 million people who had joined the Nazi party before Hitler came to power were considered hardcore Nazis, kind of like the fans who listened to the band before they were even popular. There were major logistical problems. In December 1945, half a million forms had been processed, but there was still a backlog of 4 million. It didn't help that all the questionnaires were in German, and there were only so many German translators to go around. 
There also just weren't that many Americans even in Germany working on denazification. Families in the U.S. wanted their boys to come back home, not sit around in Germany for another year doing paperwork and questioning people. All American troops were supposed to withdraw from Europe by 1947, something which was starting to look impossible. America didn't really want to run Germany. They wanted to find Germans to run Germany. The problem was, one of the most important punishments for involvement in the Nazi party was getting banned from holding public office. This meant that virtually everyone involved in politics in Germany was banned from office, and a lot of new leaders had to be found. 42% of all public officials had been kicked out of the office by the Allies. Due to these difficulties, America eventually decided to involve Germans in the denazification process. The responsibility was turned over to them. New laws came into being to set up new German-run tribunals. The goal of denazification moved more towards rehabilitation for the country than just punishing the people responsible for screwing up the country. The whole process became more efficient, but also less rigorous. Even with native Germans running the show, the caseload was still just way too big. The process had to be sped up. Germany decided that unless someone's crimes were really serious, all members of the Nazi party who had been born after 1919 were exempted. It was ruled that they had been brainwashed and therefore weren't responsible for their actions during the war. This was everyone aged 26 and younger. Someone born in 1919 would have only been 15 years old when Hitler took power. After all, it wasn't exactly their fault. 90% of cases never went to open court and were not judged to be serious enough to justify a lengthy trial. The new tribunals decided to accept statements from people the accused knew about how involved they were with the Nazi party. These statements were nicknamed Purselschien, after a German brand of whitening detergent called Persil. The system did get corrupted somewhat. People bought and sold certificates of denazification on the black market. Some Nazis who were found guilty got punished with fines, but because the fines were given in Reichsmarks, a currency which had become basically worthless, this didn't really matter. Bavaria in particular had a kind of weak denazification program. Most of the officials that America had banned from office ended up holding office again. More than half of the senior Nazis were actually reinstated. The whole process lost some credibility, and there was often local hostility aimed at the Germans who ran the tribunals. By 1948, the United States had bigger problems than denazification. The Cold War was now underway, and America was more worried about communism than whether or not every last Nazi had been tracked down. They basically just rushed through the remaining cases so that they could get the whole thing over with and move on. The Soviets looked like the more likely candidate for starting another global war, not Germany. Most of the top Nazis had either killed themselves or been executed by this point anyway. Cases from this period are seen as being of questionable value. Some members of the SS even got off without even having to show up in court. Many modern historians have described denazification as being ultimately counterproductive and a failure in some respects. Yes, the Nazi party never returned, but they didn't accomplish their original goal of truly punishing everyone who was responsible. In 1951, the West German government gave amnesty to all low-level offenders and just ended the program. Another part of denazification was a large-scale censorship program. Anything Nazi had to be confiscated and public Nazi monuments had to be taken down. The Allies created a list of over 30,000 banned books that included everything from school textbooks to poetry. Every copy of these books they could find were destroyed, and owning a book on the list was made illegal. Millions of books were destroyed. The biggest exception that they made was for tombstones honoring regular formation soldiers who died in battle. Interestingly enough, while it is currently legal to own Mein Kampf in Germany, it is banned in Russia. Whether or not someone was a member of a Nazi organization is still not exactly a casual conversation topic in Germany. Kurt Geisinger, who was the Chancellor of West Germany from 1966 to 1969, was a member. Walter Scheel, who was the President of Germany from 1974 to 1979, was a member. It's strange to think that the leader of a major country as late as 1979 was a former Nazi. The issue of ex-Nazis serving in the government has caused major controversies. In 1950, German State Secretary Hans Globke turned out to have played a major role in the drafting of the anti-Semitic Nuremberg race laws. That's a pretty big skeleton to have in your closet. In the 80s, Kurt Waldheim, President of Austria and UN Secretary General, was accused of having lied about the Nazi wartime record. 
The evidence that he had personally participated in Nazi war crimes was so strong that America actually put him on an immigration watch list and declared him to be a persona non grata. Perhaps the most famous living person who is technically a former member of the Nazis is Pope Benedict XVI. When he was 14, his church's youth group was forced to merge with the local chapter of the Hitler Youth. Germany is currently a democratic country with no plans to take over Europe. No plans that we know of, anyway. In this sense, denazification has to be called a success. Was there ever a chance that the Allies could really hunt down every single person who committed a war crime in World War II? Not really. There were too many people and World War II was just too big a scale. Similarly, was there ever a chance that they could totally wipe out Nazi ideology from the minds of everyone forever? I doubt it. Winning wars and censorship can only get you so far. There will probably always be people who are drawn to the darkest and most violent ideologies. If you enjoyed this video, you can like it down below. You can also subscribe if you'd like to see more. Thanks for watching.